Hey, welcome to Audacity Church Online. We're so glad that you could join us today. And if a friend invited you, we just wanted to say welcome. And we're so glad that you've taken some time out of your weekend to hang out with us. And we like to say welcome home. We want this to be a really safe place for you to ask big questions from God. And so all through this service, some of our leaders will be managing the comments, they'll be answering questions, and we're even here to take your prayer requests. So just put them in the comments and we'll add them to our prayer list. And we're going to sing a couple of songs together and just make much of Jesus. And then we're going to continue our series, 10 Rules for Life, and look at the next rule on what God says will bring us freedom in the midst of chaos. And although we're not gathered together, we are together. And so we believe that we should say and pray and believe the same thing that we do every week at Audacity. And this is just the way we like to kick off our services. So will you say this with me? I am a child of God, called by name. I am loved, chosen, holy, and saved by grace. Uh, today, I choose to humble myself and serve. I stir up my faith to say, God is here, so anything is possible. Today, I declare, people are my passion. His house is my priority. Excellence is my standard. Generosity is my privilege. And all of this is for Jesus. This is his day, his house, and his hour. And it all starts with my attitude of expectation. So will you expect God to do something big today? Will you worship with us?
excited about the Word of God today. We're going to look at our next 10 rule for life. As a reminder, the first four rules are foundational. They're all about God. The last six rules are about what's best for human flourishing and are always about others. We're going to start off today in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, you can look at this portion of Scripture with us. And we're actually going to look at the first murder in the Bible. It says this in Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam and Eve knew, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, and named Cain. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and he fell to his face. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. When they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. It's the reading of God's word. As we continue our series called 10 Rules for Life, it would seem that this rule needs little, if, if any, explanation. In the King James, the word is kill. You shall not kill. In, in Hebrew, it, it's simply two words. It says, no murder. The good old dictionary defines murder as the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. So let's write this down, and let's just be done with this sermon, right? Don't kill. All right, so we got it. We're done. Uh, I'll see you next week. As simple as I agree that this should be, I believe that in the climate of our current culture, the church must speak to multiple issues. So, so stay with me and, and let's just get right into the mix of it. The Bible makes a distinction between killing and murder, and it also teaches that punishment of guilt rests upon the human government or, or leadership. It also clarifies, this is in Romans and in Numbers, that that murder defiles a land. So let's start with some definitions. Is murder accidental death, self-defense, a soldier in war, or a police officer re returning fire? The answer is no, right? Hey, here's another question. Is murder infanticide, suicide, physician-assisted suicide? Or in our current climate, acts of terrorism? Yes. And this is complicated. But, but if we, like, no murder, right? We shouldn't kill anyone ever. And if we could just get our world to a place where murder wasn't common, we'd live in a much better society. God's saying for human flourishing, no murder. So if you're writing things down, write this down. Why is murder wrong? Well, God tells us in his word why he believes murder is wrong. He says this, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. And then he says why? For God made man in his own image. The creation of man was the climax of all of God's creation. Like, just take note of that and remember that the next time you look at yourself in the mirror. But God created man in his own image. Thus, human life resembles or mirrors the image of God. God is the author of life and has all authority over life. When we take murderous violence against people, according to God, we are actually attacking his likeness. Jesus says, 
If we have hatred in our heart, we've already committed that sin. This means that every person is created in the image of God, and every created person has dignity and value. And this is why for the Christian, there is no room for racism, there's no room for sexism, there's no room for classism, because every human being has dignity and value. And, and this way of life is also why Christianity has never been geographically constrained or, or race-centric. But we could go as far to say, without the Bible, you cannot defend the value of life as our passage in Genesis 4 demonstrates, all murder is demonic. Since the beginning, Satan, the adversary, has always been trying to destroy life. Now I'm going to give us some data, just for the sake of, sake of what we've called chronological snobbery, right? You would think with all the advancement in technology, all the evolution of man, and modern man is so evolved that, that we would be a whole lot better at not destroying life. But there's been four people that have murdered 175 million people in the 20th century. They are Hitler, Lenin, Mao, and Stalin. Like we've evolved so much that we've, 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 these four people have been responsible for the deaths of 175 million people. And, and for those of you that like, you know, that's ancient history because, you know, it was your grandparents' generation. Let me just explain something to you. Last year in Venezuela, 40,000 people have died. And each of these have one thing in common, and that's all of them were built upon atheistic communism. It's responsible for millions and millions of lives. We've evolved, but we're still killing people. We've evolved, but we still have a ridiculous murder rate. We've evolved, but we still see no value in life. Proverbs says this, all who hate me love death. Our hearts have become increasingly numb one study suggests that by the time a young man is 18 years old, he's witnessed 80,000 murders on TV, through movies, and video games. So in God's sight, like, is, is, is murder wrong, right? And God would say, no, murder. So we're going to answer some more questions. Like, the next question we think that we would ask is, well, what about capital punishment? Romans 13 says, let every person be subjected to subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist has been instituted by God therefore whoever resists the authorities resists who God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment so the question right is can the the state take a life now listen I didn't quote that verse as a cop out right but I, I wanted to give us a biblical starting point so let me be very clear I am not a fan of capital punishment. I'm not. There have been way too many circumstances of our system getting this wrong. So every time I hear that someone has died on death row, man, my heart just shakes a little bit. But when it comes to Scripture, the Bible gives us a couple of dozen examples of when capital punishment was instituted. So I, I believe as a Christian, we, we have to delegate this authority. We have to have some perspective of respect. That I believe that those in, in these positions better be prayerful, and they, they better be considering what they do before they blindly approve the death of a human being. And I understand that there's this deep tension for some of you that you would say, well, well civic order is, is necessary, you know, so, so what do we do? And all I can tell you is we don't live in a theocracy. We live in a constitutional republic. So with that being said, if you value life, if we say that no murder, then, then we better defend life. And in the same category, and, and I'm not saying that they're the same, but what do we do about unjust wars? And without spending too much time here, I believe that we should take the same position as we do when it comes to capital punishment. I mean, I guess if we don't like it, we could move, right? But these are very difficult decisions that I hope are being made by people who are seeking the wisdom and counsel of God and by people who are much more informed than we are. 
And the greatest thing that we could do for both of these issues, whether it's an unjust war, whether it's capital punishment, and what do we do? The greatest gift that we can give our country is to pray for our nation and to pray for our leaders. And no matter how you feel about the issue, as a Christian, you should respect and honor those in military service. You should show them respect and you should show them honor. Now, now my job is uh, a, a lot of sharing scripture. So I ask that you just sincerely hear my heart as the pastor of Audacity. I want you to know that my heart is not to offend. And I also realize that many of you are going to have big questions that you want to sit down and, and ask me. And I want to discuss them with you. As I move on, I, I know a lot of people make certain issues political, but I, I want to be clear, the Bible doesn't know politics. Israel was a theocracy, and, and we are nigh. So, so this is not a political issue. It is, however, a life issue. And I ask that you just take the next few moments and, and, and just hear me out. And before I do that, let, let me just share a couple of quotes for the foundation of at least the position that I, I want us to look at today. Quote, we should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. End of quote. The next quote. Quote, birth control must lead ultimately to a cleaner race. End quote. The next quote. Quote, our objective is unlimited sexual gratification without the burden of unwanted children. Women must have the right to live, to love, to be lazy, or to be on a married mother, to create, to destroy. The marriage bed is the most degenerative influence in the social order. The most merciful thing a family does to one of its infant members is to kill it, end quote. Each of those quotes are from Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was, was the founder of Planned Parenthood. And you can make any attempt that you want to have a positive approach about this organization. But I can guarantee you that this foundation was built upon racist, demonic population control of the black people as its plan. It all started to keep the black population low and uneducated. Period. End of story. And if you would like to debate that fact, you can look it up today. 88% of all Planned Parenthood locations are still in urban areas as defined by the U.S. Census Bureau. So I, the cat's out of the bag now, right? The question is, what about abortion? The reason that I believe abortion has become such a political issue in our current culture is because now it is a billion dollar industry. First trimester abortions cost around $400, makes up about $438 million. Second trimester abortions cost over $3,000, it makes up $393 million. For those of you that are like me and stink at math, right, we, we're, we're now uh, close to approaching a billion dollars. And if you add the 337 million Planned Parenthood uh, grants that they receive and contracts that they receive, the abortion industry is well over a billion dollars. I, I lovingly ask you to hear my heart. Where do Christians stand on abortion? No murder. Abortion is not a choice issue. Abortion is a life issue. Listen, I know we're wading into some deep waters, but I ask you just listen. Since Roe versus Wade was passed, 56 million babies have had their heart stopped. That number is huge. 
So I, I want to contextualize that number just a minute for you. I want you to imagine if there were no people alive in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, Nebraska, Arizona, Colorado, Kansas. You take the combined population of those states and you get 56 million people. You might go as far to say to me today, well, Ronnie, we need to have the same position as we do on capital punishment. It's legal. And I would say that an unborn child didn't murder anyone. So from, from that perspective, they're, they're far from the same. So the next question people ask when, when I discuss this is, when does life begin? And, and I believe when dealing with life and murder, we need to stay very consistent with the definition of God and ask, do we bear the image of God? Are you a clump of cells or were you birthed with a conscience and a spirit? And there's no simple answer. The rule for life is, is no murder because it's best for human flourishing. 1.5% of all abortions are because of rape and incest. And, and if you want to meet me there and that's where you want to have the conversation, and I'm open to it. But according to a USA Today article in 2019 explaining why abortions, 74% of women said the baby would dramatically change my life. I cannot afford a baby. Of those that were polled, half of them say they don't want to be a single mother or they're having relationship issues. Now, we addressed relationship issues in single motherhood last week in, in the rule for life, honoring your mother and your father. But I would say uh, another argument, since I, I kind of talk for a living, I've had hundreds of conversations. But most people have an issue with the Bible. And one that comes back to government or comes back to capital punishment. And we would say, well, you can't tell me what to do with my body. And friend, as, as anecdotal as that sound, that's not true. It's untrue. If you don't believe me, this I, I just give you two challenges today. Challenge number one is go find some medicine, a narcotic that hasn't been prescribed to you, or maybe get a street drug that's still illegal, and just go to the police office, uh, a police officer, and say, hey, these are mine. I'm going to come to the police station. These are mine, and uh, I don't want you to take them from me. Let's we'll see what happens. Uh, an, another way, uh, if you're really feeling frisky, what you can do is take all of your clothes off and just go streaking. Right? Like, the, the, now, listen, this could be a little bit more fun, but it's going to have a, a similar end. Laws are made to protect you. Laws are made to protect people. And some of you might be thinking right now, well played. You have the mic. You've made a valid argument, and I'm still not convinced because I really don't care what you say. Well, good point. Me neither. So, so what, is, what does God say? Write this down. What does God say about no murder? What does God say about life? The truth is, when it comes to Scripture, my opinions my feelings, and even my experiences do not matter when they come in opposition with the Word of God. So what does the Word of God say about life? In Psalms 139, this is what the psalmist says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well deepest part of your soul, you realize that you are a unique creation, the conscious and the spirit, and you know that. The God, as, as we studied right a few weeks ago, who comes down, looks at you intimately and wants to know you. He says, I've been waiting for this day. I've had you on my calendar for your arrival. God says there is something unexplainable that still can't be plain, explained scientifically. It's because I take 
part in it. It's me. And maybe you would say that the Bible isn't specific enough. It says no murder. The Bible says that, that God sees a child as one in the womb. And, and just to share another story, because sometimes if, if, if the words aren't crystal clear for you, we can look at examples and narratives and principles in the Scripture. In Luke chapter 1, Mary is pregnant with Jesus. And she goes to her cousin's house. <clears throat> and Elizabeth, it says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby, because she was pregnant also with John the baptizer, the baby leaped in her womb, and Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she explained with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Dear friends, the first evangelist of the good news of the coming Messiah was an unborn baby baby leapt in the presence of Jesus, the Messiah and King. Friends, it, listen, I, I love you. I want to love and serve and lead this house well. But I have to be honest. We have to come together. We have to look at what the Word of God says. And if you want to have a spiritual conversation with me about the 1.5% and rape, I'll, I'll listen to you. Just know that Scripture says no murder. An another thing that has become such commonplace today is that when a mother is told that her child is born with Down syndrome, that they should have an abortion. And I've never met a parent that has a child that has Down syndrome that says that that child wasn't a blessing. I, I, let me just be real transparent with you. I remember when Ashley and I were expecting one of our kids, and we've actually never told this to the kid this. We're at the doctor, and we we're getting our update, and, and both of us are just excited. We have a growing family. And the doctor told us that our baby was going to have Down syndrome and two other complications. And it was almost assumed that because of our family size, maybe because of any, I don't know, but the assumption was that we would just terminate the pregnancy. That there was no way that Ashley and I would allow that to be our response. I do remember thinking, man, this is going to kind of change our lives. We already have a large family and it's going to look different. But abortion was never an option because simply put, we said, is not this child also born, also bearing the image of God? Jesus enters into human history. He could have done it any way he liked, and yet he chose to enter into a poor, rural, and uneducated single mother. And that's how he chose to enter history, to save the world. So Jesus knows how we feel. He was rejected, despised, and lied about. He got tired. And yes, Jesus identifies with the unborn in the pre born. If you study the Gospels, even the political leaders of Jesus' time tried to kill him. So, so what do we do as the church? As the church, we must speak truth. As the church, you cannot say, well, I, I would never do that, but, but I could, can't put my beliefs on somebody else. I believe that that is cowardice. Every day we live in a society that protects life. All laws, whether they're speed limits or controlled drug use, whatever. Man, you can't even go streaking, right? For the church, abortion is not a political issue. For the church, it's a human rights issue. We must walk and, and talk and share the hope and truth and love of Jesus Christ. If you have rights today, then every child, every created being that bears the image of God deserves the exact same rights you do. I mean, even if you study the, the complexity of, of our culture, I mean, courts have even said that unborn children have life. There, there's people that are spending over a decade in prison. One guy specifically who, who gave his girlfriend 
basically a morning after pill so that she would miscarry. And let me just, for our culture, understand that this same pill is now available in junior high and high schools to young girls. And they don't even have to ask their parents. They, they, they have to call you if you give your da- to give your daughter aspirin. But this is the culture that we live in. And I know that this is a heavy issue, but the Bible says it's clear. People are created in the image of God. God knows the unborn people inside the womb. He uses children in the womb to glorify himself. And God says, one of my rules for life is no murder. So in closing, church, we must walk in love, period. And and if you've had an abortion, then I want you to know that there is hope. Jesus loves you. And he was murdered for you on the cross so that you could be forgiven. I'm a, most women I talk to are haunted by this decision. Some even have a calendar circled, the date that it happened, and it haunts them. Our culture says that abortion doesn't hurt, but you can look at all the scientific. It, it increases your potential rate of getting cancer. There's all of these things that can happen. Allow Jesus' forgiveness just to wash over you right now. And to men, you're not off the hook. If you've ever neglected a woman, if you ever decided to encourage her to get an abortion, and you're, what you've done is in the opposite of God's word, and you too need to come to the cross to confess and ask God for healing. As we tackle the issues in Scripture, and some of them are tough, we always go to the Scripture and we always go to prayer. We can't afford to allow our opinions and our feelings or even our experiences to be in opposition to God's Word. The baby who entered human history vulnerable grew to live a sinless life. And Jesus willingly died on the cross for our sins, for the sin of humanity. And Jesus offers redemption for all sin. There will be murderers in heaven. There will be men in heaven and women in heaven who fought unjust wars. There will be people in heaven who have had abortions. Murder does not send you to hell. And abortion does not send you to hell. The only thing that puts you in hell, separated from a loving God, is not believing in the resurrection of Jesus and accepting his free gift of salvation. So church, we must rise up. We must love people, no matter what choices they made and no matter what circumstances they are in. And we need to stand in the gap. And we need to pray. And if you're watching this live stream today and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus right where you're sitting, I just ask that you do me a favor. Just say, Jesus, I believe in the resurrection. Come into my heart. Change my life. You can go to audacitychurch.info and share any decision that you made with us today. But I'm going to pray. Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for your goodness and your word. Father, we pray that we would value life. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom. Give us the words that we need to say. Help us to seek truth. Jesus, help us to die to our flesh and to allow you to live through us. Jesus, I pray that we would not be jaded by our own opinions or even our feelings, by our experiences, but we would stand firm on the truth of your word and the value that you place on human flourishing. We ask all this in your name. Amen. searching searching for you I'm so thirsty thirsty for more of you it feels like I'm alone here in this desert and in this desert land I look to you Holy Spirit come alive Rushing wind consume everything I've got and everything I am and say
deepest longing is just to know you more, your glory. As my brokenness restored, your presence is where I always long to be. City Church online today. We would love to connect with you. If you made a decision today, man, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us and find out everything we have going on at audacitychurch.info. And at Audacity, we love to say we inspire generosity. So for those of you who've already given in, thank you for helping continue to make our house healthy. For those of you that haven't given yet and you would like to, you can go to audacitychurch.info. There's a link right there that says give. But listen, we want this to be a time where the church continues to be strengthened. There are so many organizations, there are so many ministries, and there's even schools across the world that are expecting our generosity. So in this season, where we have a bunch of big questions, let's not let our generosity be questioned. And thank you for joining Audacity Church online. We hope to see you next week.